I feel like a little bit of a hypocrite, though. Give me a second. I feel like a hypocrite because if that was on display in Israel, I'd go. <laughs> no, no, I'm going to say, if I, I still might touch it. <laughs> Just in case. Okay. What does that if I did that, that, yeah, the hand of the garment, that, right that might have been Jesus. Like I won't. Okay, I didn't want to if say. My presence, I might like, give it a shot. <laughs> I didn't want to say, but I was thinking the same thing. But I thought I'd just go a little more conservative. Be like I'd still go to Israel and see it. Okay, but if we're all being honest, if no one's looking and I got a chance to touch it, I'm gonna touch it for sure. That's that's a fact. But but I'm just saying we don't we don't want to we don't want to turn it into a golden calf. That that's the whole thing. We don't we don't want idolatry. Hey, welcome to Not A Fitted Podcast. It's your boy, Anthony, the conservative Chicano. What's going on, peeps? What's going on? I got the bishop and the token in the house. Mike. What happened? I didn't tell you this. Oh, no. Yeah, I feel bad even spring this on you. But I thought about inviting another pastor to come on the set, but he is white. And Am I going to be upset if there's two of us? Yes. <laughs> I, I know. I, I think we there should be more of us. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, so don't laugh. But I thought I was gonna call him since you're the token, the other white guy. <laughs> <laughs> is that doing too much? No, I love it. Or or you think this guy might get offended? Well, I don't know who it is. Okay. So. Well, you some do, people would. You do know you do know who he is. But oh, I just haven't told you who it is. Yeah. Yeah. So the other white guy. So some white guys would get offended. Okay. Other people who just grew up like... Am, am I doing so much? Am I rolling the dice already? Of, by doing what? By calling, giving him the title of the other one. I don't know, know who it is. I got to know who it is. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. we don't know what the, the, what's the type of guy he is. Because, <laughs> I, I mean, we all grew up in an era where... He, you, has, he you, has multiple black friends. I'm not even going to go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We he has a lot of Mexican friends. He has a lot so of Mexican friends. I think friends. he's going to love the title, The Other White Guy. I think in his selective friend group, he might just be The Other White Guy. Yeah. Well, everyone has a Mexican friend. You have no choice. Hey, hey. You're here in California. I, <laughs> you have no you know, choice. I, yeah. I don't know that that's to be 100% accurate. I want to, if someone does have a Mexican friend, please <laughs> call me. in the comment Let us know. that you don't have a Mexican friend. <laughs> Let us know. Oh, gosh. We're already in trouble. We might have to, hey, hold we, on, let's, let's redo this. Rewind this. We're going to have to redo it all over again. Okay, okay. So I got to do a shout out. You guys are going to give, that one's going to give me a lot of trouble. But I do want to say to everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. We do appreciate you guys. Uh, thank you for putting up with us too, because we know our sense of humor is different. As you know, we call it the Not Offended Podcast because despite what people may post sometimes, these people seem really offended. We're not offended. That's the whole point. We want to talk about things that most people are afraid to talk about, especially when it comes to culture and its influence on the church. I need y'all to just do me one favor. Uh, I'm so grateful everybody tuning in. Everything's been good. Um, people have been liking the stuff and follow us on Instagram and stuff is getting right back up to normal again on that side. Our YouTube is doing great. We're adding subscribers every week. I want to say this to you. If there is something that you're benefiting from this and you know you have a friend out there who you think would really benefit from this, go ahead and send them the link and tell them to tune in. Give us a couple of episodes and we think you will really enjoy it. So, so share that love by sending a link out to somebody saying, hey, tune in. Hey, I'm going to shout out though because I tell you guys to, to leave it in the box, leave it in the comment section, whether on Instagram or YouTube, um, you know, where you're watching from and I'll shout you out. So we got Tyler. I, I, you, Mike was teaching me how to say this. I think it's Worcester. I, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Worcester. Worcester. Yeah, it's like, uh, it's, it's like I I don't know how close a, something has to be to be a suburb, but we'll just call it like a suburb of Boston. Of Boston, Boston. It sounds okay. East Coast. Yeah, it sounds East Coast. Worcester, Massachusetts. Thank you so much, Tyler, for watching us. We do appreciate it. If you know of other people, sounds he, like a lot of mics. That's a lot there. of mics up there. Yeah. yeah, he's he's got a good point. That's a lot of mics. There's a lot of mics. The reason Mike knew where was at. Oh, okay. Is I've that, been there. Oh, yeah, there, there, there. See, <laughs> See? That's proved my point. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm thinking. So is it racist if it's true? What's true? No one said anything about being racist. Yeah. Well, no, which part was true? <laughs> no. His comment, depending on who you ask, is racist. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> why? What, what I miss? Hold on. You why did it go right over my head? <laughs> because it's true. That's why I'm saying. <laughs> oh. If, if, if something is true, is it racist? 
Like there's a lot of Mexicans because in Fresno? Because he goes, sounds like there's a lot of mics out there. Oh, okay. No, how's that racist? Okay, should we go? Should we, should we try? <laughs> no, no, no. Should we, no. Should nope. we put this shoe on another foot? Nope, no. Nope. Well, you say there's a lot of Mexicans in Fresno. There's nothing not true about that. That's not where he was going. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So, I'm sitting here going, hold on, am I slow today? Am I slow today? Because I feel slow right now. But, but what I wanted to say was, Tyler, if you know of another friend out there in the in the in the Boston area or the Worcester area, I feel like I gotta say it with like a, like a northeastern accent. Uh, please uh, send them the link, show the love. Even if they are pastors, I think they get a kick out of it. Okay, comment sections. We had a lot of comments. I was really surprised after our clips were. Uh, I think Nate and I were talking about this. We feel like they're getting turned down a little bit, and then all of a sudden. Um, we hit this groove again, lots of comments, lots of stuff happening again. And I, I thought this comment, this comes off the Paul Washer, Paul Washer comment about what's the biggest threat to the church. He said the pastors and, um, somebody left a comment. I had to comment back. It was super funny. He says the, the biggest threat to Paul Washer is he's missing his nap. I thought that was hilarious because he, he, he always does seem like he's <laughs> like, you know, either he, I shouldn't say that. Okay. So I was going to say it, but I'm trying to be, you know, a little bit more nice about things uh to the most part but he always seems kind of like a little you know a little down like he needed a nap but anyway uh this comment it it's on that it was on that clip um i want you to read it bishop but i at first so i i try to reread comments two or three times before i comment and the first time i read it i was like nah this can't be i think he's just throwing shade i read it again and i read it again and I kind of got this feeling like there might be something there. So I'm going to let you guys um, listen to this comment that Bishop's about to read. And then I just want to dialogue a little bit because I, I think there's some substance there. Go ahead. Um, I, I don't have the guy's name, but he says, um, I'm a barber. I promise I promise you there are undercover pastors. Many. Um, same thing with worship leaders. The pastor is also um, rife with pastors who do not know what that, those who don't know what that means, let alone anything else in the Bible. Don't know exactly what that's meant to say. But we're trying to talk, um, when trying to talk to them about the Bible, so many are lost on the basic, uh, on basics. It's mind blowing. Uh, the music ministry slash band members a lot of times tell, um, tell me that they do it simply because they get to play slash sing and some of it's um, playing gig, playing gigs, not because they believe, actually believe in God. Um, all in all, meeting pastors on a barber's level show, has shown me that being a pastor has become a career choice, not uh, too far detached from basic entrepreneurship. But unlike circular entrepreneurship, they can, all, they can slap God, they can slap going on what they are doing to mitigate the risks. What did you what did you think of that, Mike, when when he was saying that and it was unconverted is what he meant to say. They're unconverted pastors. They're not they're, they don't have the you know, the, the fruit of the spirit in their lives. What do you think about that? He says he's a barber and he he knows, as if he's cutting their hair, which is a possibility. Do you th do you think he's onto something? Yeah, I mean I wouldn't totally throw uh throw everything he's out as not being um what he's experienced. Um you, we, we've seen it talking about different pastors, uh, even on our show, uh, right. of of people who like are doing outlandish things, saying crazy things. Um, we see it in the music uh, industry. I was going to say he brought up worship leaders specifically. Um, Would that make you think? Oh yeah, I, I don't. I don't disagree. I think there probably are unconverted pastors who do it just for um, a, a career choice. Uh, yeah, for sure. Am I going to say they're all like that? Absolutely not. But I think there are when, some. When, when do you guys think that changed? Rife, by the way, rife literally means to be, um, uh, it's, it's, it says to be undesirable or harmful of common occurrence widespread. So um, basically, you know, they're, what they're doing is, is, is not right. And what they're doing is with the wrong motives. So, in other words, what he brought up at the end, they were doing it for a career and not a calling. So he's saying that the pulpits are rife with that, that there are people now who are just doing this because they're getting paid to. Which, by the way, brings me to what did you think about his comments on band members and worship leaders? They don't really love God. They're just getting that shine and getting paid to sing songs about God. Um, I do think there's probably pastors especially as they get older that are doing it to keep collecting checks. 
Um, I think we've seen some examples of that. Um, band members, I think that's always a because obviously they started learning music because they like music. Right. They love playing the instrument. And so there's always this tricky place with, in terms of worship. It's like you enjoy actually doing it. Right. And it's fun for you to do it. But then where does it come to a place where, no, you're doing this for God and it's worship? Mm. Like, because you're always going to have that balance that you're fighting with. Of uh, that, hey, I want to be up there. I want to play in front of those people. I want to be on stage because you like playing music. But no, are you doing it with the right motives? And I think it's for anyone. That's your whole life. You're doing that. So you're doing- saying, so, you, so let me, just so I get you straight, you're saying whether it's the pastor or the band leader don't matter. Is where's your motive? Where's your heart? For the believer, for any believer, where's your heart at? You're, to, you're, you're trying to do everything to, to honor God. But when you're on that stage on that platform, it can get tricky real quick. Tricky. My, See? that was your cue right <laughs> there. there. Go ahead. What do you think about, you, you agree with Bishop, there's no difference between the pastor and the worship leader if you're, do, if you're not doing this for your calling, but you're doing it for a career and to collect the paycheck. Where would you stand on that? Yeah, I agree. Um, I, and I, I, I agree that you can't just say because there's been some bad examples that everybody's like that. Um, and you can't say that everybody who is what we would say like um, talented or gifted or good in that area is only doing it to, f- to fulfill themselves. So what I mean by that is like you can't say just because a, a pastor is extremely good at communicating that being extremely good equates him to being, you know, only doing it for okay. self-motivation. Right. So, so and then likewise for for music as well. Sure. So you're saying out here uh, as as a parishioner looking um, to the pastor, to the worship leader, you got to be real careful too. you're not being judgmental just because this person's a really good singer or a really good teacher. You're not sitting here deducing everything down to all. Oh, he must be a hireling. Uh, he must be doing this. Um, I, OK, since you guys brought that up, I thought this was real interesting. I wasn't planning on, on showing this, but since you brought it up, I do have a clip of a worship leader that I want to show you guys. And he says something that, once again, I, I I listened to it a few times, and I still don't know if I agree with everything he's saying. But I and this is this is one of these clips where I think you need to watch the whole sermon because I think they just clipped out a part to get you to talk. Because I really feel like he was going somewhere else with it, but we just never got there in the clip. Does that make sense? So let's talk about that. But I want you since we're on this subject about calling and career and not mixing the two between what we call secular and sacred, right? and just really trying to discern the difference. Okay, but but watch this and and tell me. Kids would come up to me and they'd say, when did you know being a musician was God's will for your life? I go, oh, it's not. And they go, what? (laughs) If I believe that being a musician is God's will for my life, what happens if I get in a car accident and I break my throat? I can't sing. What happens if I break my fingers, can't play? What happens if my brain gets injured and I can't write lyrics? Have I missed God's will for my life now? That question has already been answered in Scripture. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for your life. Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly. In other words, it seems to me, scripturally, that God's plan for your life is not a career path. God's plan for your life is the posture of your heart. Huh. What would you would you think? Uh, okay, Go ahead, because then I then I tell you what I had the problem with. But what what was your guys' first thoughts? Uh, I partially agree with them. Like that that is that is the first step of of um, doing God's will is to do those things to start off with. But then it also is still lead somewhere. Like you're still living your life, and it's like, does God? Are you should you be on the worship team, or should you not be on? Or should you be a pastor? There's still a calling. So yeah, everyone wants to walk those. That is the that is the will for every believer. It's to do these certain things. Can I ask you? But where does it go from there? Okay. Can I ask you? I, I feel like, I feel like it was too broad of a stroke. In other words, it was a macro. There's a macro and there's a micro. So yes, in totality, as a believer. And by the way, he missed a couple. You know, of God. This is God's will for your life. He missed a couple because. It says that Thessalonians, this is God's will for your life to be sexually pure. Does that make sense? So mm-hmm. if you're going to do this is God's will for you, you got to do them all, not just a select few, not just the Micah, you know, not just those ones he did. You got to do them all. But I feel like that's the general in totality as a believer. And then there's the micro, the, 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 sele- the selective calling. Like he has given some gifts for those to be a teacher, mm-hmm. those to be, you know, not everybody can sing. That's obvious, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I feel like that's what he was kind of missing a little bit is. He gave us a foundation. 
Correct. Yeah, everyone needs to do this. This is right. a, like saying this real broad. This is God's right. will for everyone's life. But then where do you go from there? Right. What'd you think of it? I, but I, I, but once again, I feel like he was victim of that was just a short clip. That was all. It, it, yeah, I could have been clipped up. And he was like, man, that's not what I was trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. You can see the cuts. So. But and, and you can see that he was going down a thought process though. Yeah. Which I agree with your your identity is not found in what you do is what what he should have said. My identity is not being a worship leader because something can happen to me, and whether it happens to you or not. You know, your identity is not found. My identity is found in Christ, yeah. not in my abilities. Abilities and identity is two different things. Now, they co-intersect, but your identity and ability do stand on their own as well. Yeah, Kid Rekha, what if you really were a singer and something happened in your throat and you can't sing anymore? It, it Are you out of the will of God now? Like, what happened? But by like, the way, you know? that, that happens whether it's secular or sacred. John mm. Bon Jovi just went through that. He went through it where after vocal cord surgery, he's done. And this guy was getting ready to do a huge comeback tour, you know, of all the old classics and all the new stuff. Yeah, I watched the whole documentary. I'm a Bon Jovi fan. I watched the whole documentary. No, I'm just surprised. Isn't the guy like 90? No, he's not 90. Oh. Man, dude, that's a little harsh. If you told me he was dead, I would have believed Oh, my gosh. Both of you. Both of you. That's <laughs> not, that's it. Now I am offended. That's gross, <laughs> ne- I, he's that's gross negligence I right there. He's, he's got to be in the 70s. He's, he's in his 60s. Okay, now, now by the way. And that's like 70s. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> by the way. By the way, that was cold. Uh, I, I just I just say that because that happens to a lot of musicians. You know, that happens to a lot of musicians, especially vocal musicians who really belt. Mm-hmm. So your identity is found in Christ, but your ability is something God has given you as well, too. So, okay, anyway, what did you think of that clip? Um, yeah, because I was, I was wondering who his audience was. Um, it sounds... I've been in the room where um, worship leaders will be, uh, you know, doing... A, seminar type you know type setting with other worship leaders and it sounds a lot of times it'll sound stuff like that where they're they're talking to other uh people who are are gifted in music um or that also sounds like to me like a a youth setting where he's talking to youth who are trying to find uh i'm only smiling because you looked up john John bon no no i did not look up john bon jovi's age so i'm sitting here thinking did did, did Mike Cook, the token himself, say, I sit in worship? No, I have sat. Because <laughs> I, I could have swear, every time I've seen you come out of those things, you just look more confused than when you walked in. Like, what nah, did I just sit in? Nah, I'm going to slap the dude the last time I was in one of those. <laughs> you'd be killing me sometimes. But no, I it, 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 now that you that I think that adds to the point of just being clipped, that brings a little bit of clarity. If he was speaking context if he was speaking to a room full of worship leaders that added a lot of context yeah because i think he is in that context i think he is talking identity like right. got you got you see that's i don't mind playing clips but i appreciate you guys opinions because that does help paint a picture for everybody who's listening too but i do want to be real clear your identity in christ is one thing your ability that's given from christ is a, is, is a total another and so some, and for most part, they do uh, co-collide or intersect sooner or later, but they are still two separate things because because you are more than just what you do. That's what it comes down to. And I will also say this: some people will use that as an excuse to not use their gifts. What do you mean? Go ahead. Uh, so in, there are so many people who are, are amazing musicians, but they'll land on. Well, that's not who I am. My identity is found in Christ. I don't. Ne- I don't need to use my gift. Mm. And and so it's like with like with Deshaun. At least what I was understanding what Deshaun was saying is yeah, yeah. That's that's a you know, being in God's will in this way is the first step. That is the foundation. But then what do you do next? Well, what you do next is you use the gifts that yeah. God's given you, and that's mm-hmm. the way that you honor Him and that you Spot worship on. Him. But I think that sometimes you get the radical, and there's, I don't think there's a whole lot of people, okay. but I do think that there is a radical who will say, well, because this is who I am and this is my identity and my standing with the Lord, I don't have to mm. use my gifts because that's not what I'm called to do or something like that. I think he's spot on on that. I think that was good. That was good. Okay. Uh, we got to get to the sci-fi section. We missed it last week, but I got something to show you. UFOs. It's not UFOs, but... All right, it's but maybe a conspiracy. Theory. It may be a conspiracy. So, and Bishop, this is an honor of you. I felt like this is speaking your language. So, I want you guys. Um, it's not really a video. It's more of a picture and an article. We're gonna put the link. We'll put the video, the picture up, and then we'll put the link in the bio. But I want you to see this, and I want you to guess what it is. Okay. Okay. 
Do you know what that is? Every good Catholic would know what that is. Do you know what this is? I'm not calling you a good Catholic, but do you know what this is? Oh, is it the... Um, is it called the Shroud? Or? It is called the Shroud. Shroud of what? I don't know. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, I was thinking that after Thanksgiving, it looks like the turkey. <laughs> 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 no, you got that wrong. <laughs> That's called the Shout of Turin. Okay. The yeah. Shout of Turin, which was supposed to be what? Do you know what that was supposed to be? What Jesus was wrapped in? What Jesus was wrapped in. Mm-hmm. They the news broke this week that they have d- done their testing and this definitely was from the era of Jesus's time. And people are saying, well, this proves that Jesus existed, and what they're saying is some type of uh, energy, massive atomic nuclear, some type of energy radiated through his body so much that it left this 3D imprint on this shroud that is from the time of his era. And people are saying that this was him as he was resurrecting from the dead, that God used his power, the power of creation and it's so radiated through his body in some type of illumination that it stained the shroud. Are you buying it? Uh, Can I'm, you put I'm, some theatrical music I'm, right for that long pause? Let's just do something. Is he buying it like it's yeah. on eBay? Or no. What? <laughs> are you say, no, are you buying it like this is true? Well, I believe, you know, Jesus really died and was wrapped in some clothes and came, you know, raised from the dead. So could it be true? Oh, yeah. the bit, the bit yeah, I mean. for not being a conspiracy theorist. He, he's, I feel like he's buying this one token. I feel like, I feel like there's a little purchase going on right here. What about you? You buying it? So they were able to uh, test uh-huh. and, and get a dating that's near the time of Jesus. Very, very near. If not the time of Jesus, definitely in the ballpark. As you baseball players would say, it's in the ballpark. All right. Um, and I don't, I mean, I don't know what the source is, uh, Oh, this you can find it on every major news outlet right now. Everybody, right? The and source, a, uh, the source of like who's doing the study. It's, it's and legit. Stuff. It was. It's a few different um, archaeological so, and. Few so what places. other what other things could it have been? Well, I mean, it could be a shroud of a of a different person. It doesn't have to necessarily be Jesus. It could, but but it, that would uh that would leave that imprint. Well, they're definitely it's definitely a, a human being imprint. They're not arguing that whether or not it's Jesus and actually from Jesus's time is what they're arguing. His exact time. Was it between 30 and 33 AD? You know, that type of deal. Or was it sooner that or a little bit later than that? You can't pinpoint the exact year. They're not going to go May of 30 with, you know, May of 31. Yeah. But they're saying that there was such an illumination of light that left this imprint. So what, what would, they don't have an answer. What would something else, Mm. you know? Well, I mean, I'm sure that there's hypotheses out there. Maybe like somebody, getting hit by lightning, that mass type of illuminate. I mean, I'm sure they can reason a couple more things. I think what makes this interesting is the fact that, that a couple of things that number one, that we're able to date stuff back from there. I think that's pretty cool. But number two, just if I can, we've had this cloth for thousands of years and it's passed through different, you know, kingdoms and dynasties and all this stuff. Anyway, long story short, What I think is interesting is from day one, people have been saying this is the shroud of Turin. This is from Christ himself. So no, the old church fathers, the old people who've had this stuff have never wavered that this wasn't Christ's loincloth or his cloth period. Sorry, his cloth in general. So I think that's, and now they're all feeling validated. Like we told you. So for them to come up, which they can't come up with other theories, which is fine. They're going, no, you can come up with all the theories you want, but we've been saying this. There was, in other words, there was never any divergence. There was never any any other conclusions other than the Shroud of Turin belonging to Christ. There was, another, there was never any other speculations. Other speculations started coming in afterwards. Well, is this really it? Is it not, right? Mm-hmm. And now that, this, now that this testing is proving the date period, the, all they're saying is that validates what we've been saying. It was from Christ. Now... What I find interesting about it is what you said. How do you argue against it? If science is backing up, you can't argue against something happened. You can't argue against that it's a man because you can see all that in the Shroud of Turin. You can't argue against all you All you can really argue was whether or not that was Christ. That's all you can really argue. Well, one thing I, I would say is I wouldn't put 
your hope or faith in this to validate your faith. Um, okay, because I because I wouldn't trust even completely the science. I'm gonna trust the Bible over science. Too, yeah. So I so if if you think this is, I don't think that's any problem with that. But don't put all if, if this comes back and say the science was wrong. We actually we messed up. Who cares? Don't don't hang your faith on that. You so don't like, get depressed. Right. Give up. Okay. Yeah. Man, it's got like his full face. It does. Yes. That's pretty wild. And that's what I'm saying. From from early church history on, they have been. Yeah, they have been declaring this. I, I listen. I agree. He with looks you. like a white Jesus, though. <laughs> <laughs> he was a Jew. <laughs> mm. uh, there you go. Uh, the the thing that I find a, a little just. If you if if I can just a little interesting, I do want to say this. I'm piggybacking on that. We don't we don't validate our faith from that, but we also shouldn't go seeking that for miracles, because that's what happens. We start to turn it into idolatry. Mm-hmm. Oh, if, if it just touches me, I'll be healed. No, if God touches you, you're healed. Period. Now, I feel like a little bit of a hypocrite, though. Give me a second. <laughs> I feel like a hypocrite because if that was on display in Israel, I'd go. <laughs> no, no, I'm gonna say if I, I still might touch it. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> okay. What does that if I just that, have a, yeah, the hem of the garment, that, right that, that might have been Jesus. Like I would. Okay, I didn't want to say. My presence, I'm like giving it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say, it, but I was thinking the same thing. But I thought I'd just go a little more conservative. Be like I'd still go to Israel and see it. Okay, but if we're all being honest, if no one's looking and I got a chance to touch it, I'm gonna touch it for sure. That's that's a fact. But but I'm just saying we don't we don't wanna we don't wanna turn it into a golden calf. That that's the whole thing. We don't we don't want idolatry. But I do think it's pretty cool. And that's all I was getting. So all right, I finally brought you some sci fi. Y'all I, buying. I would buy that more than the UFO in Brazil or wherever that was. Oh, but I have some stories. The last Joe Rogan podcast about UFOs in Brazil. I actually um Okay, I tell you what. I tell you what. I was on a long walk this weekend, just just having an Anthony. I, I like to take walks for myself sometimes too. Just having Anthony moments. I listen to this podcast. I'm not saying I think I got some answers, but I think I got some answers. And I tell you what, maybe next week I'll get into the UFO thing, and I'll get into what I really think is going on here. And I, I just got to do a little bit more investigation. I want to bring some facts, but I I think I think I can explain it. I really do. I think I can explain it. I'm gonna bring my tin foil hat. Oh my god! <laughs> and I think I'm gonna, okay. Okay, moving on. Let's talk about the message this last Sunday, First uh, Thessalonians four, and I know we all got a chance to preach it. Um, I wanted to ask you guys thoughts on a statement I made, and we don't have to necessarily talk about that. We can talk about whatever you want, but I wanted to get your thoughts because I felt like I, I don't feel like it was a risk, or nor do I feel like it was a jump. But I made the comment about Timothy Keller saying. That, and I believe he was one that quoted. That's who I heard it from first. He said, "Pride is not one sin amongst many; it's the root of all sin." I, you guys all know that because you read the same books I did. <clears throat> I had said, "Excuse me." I had said that if that's one A, which I have no problem saying that's one A. I felt like one B was that sexual immorality is the glue that binds together all the works of the flesh. That if you can't get your sexual life in order, then you won't be able to get anything in order. In other words, if you can't get disciplined in this and say no to this area of your life, you won't say no to any area of your life. Because it literally is the fuel and the food that feeds the works of the flesh. Did I say too much? Am I off? Am I wrong? What are you guys thinking about that statement I made? That it's a glue that holds all these sins together. Just go ahead. Give me your thoughts. I don't know about it being an absolute Okay. Um, but so, but so what would you give it a rule of thumb? Not an well, absolute. Well, no, no. I was gonna say, but based on like our experiences, um, being you know involved in a lot of people's lives um, as pastors, I would say that that is very, very true. Okay. Um, and often being able to see like, hey, somebody whose character starts to change, and and you're like, man, how what what what's what's happening with this person right and like you're right. seeing it only from the outside you don't really know what, what's going on and then oftentimes there is some sort of root of sexual immorality that's mm. causing this person mm. to like often or start to like bend a little bit um and then also just being able to see people's lives who just you know they they appear to take one step forward two steps forward three steps forward but they don't have this area of their life in check and they take a huge step backwards 
Uh, and so as I said, I don't know about an, as an absolute, but I have definitely seen this play out in life and I would agree. What about you, Bishop? It, it's, it's, yeah, I guess, I'll say it was the same thing as Mike. I don't know if it's absolute, but it's, it's close. Is I mean close to being there because I mean you see it addressed so many times in the scripture. Um, I think you can say if you make it a little more broad that if you can't control your desires, oh. so whatever it may be, whatever passions that you have, of whatever bent you have to whatever, and a lot of times that's going to be sexual. Um, but whatever passion you have, if you can't get your body, because he says that in the scripture, you he know, did, he but did. he says you know that you need to be able to control your body. And if I think if you're not able to do that, you're going to see like major destruction in your life. So you're saying, um, okay, okay, I just want to make sure I'm hearing both of you correctly. You're saying, I don't know about it being an absolute, but it's pretty close. And you're saying if you made it a little bit broader of a stroke, it might be an absolute. Whatever your passion is. <clears throat> These are your passion and desires. If you can't get those under under check, it's going to destroy you. Because a big mm. thing that I had brought up was um, Interesting. Okay. talked about you know not treating your brother bad. And so the way that I took it was if you can't control your passions, you're going to treat people bad. Oh, for because, sure. Because you're... Cause you're going to want to feed that passion and you're willing to hurt people to fulfill your passion. Even though you like, I mean, I really don't want to hurt them, but I got to feed this. So I'm going to take advantage of my, oh. I'm going to take advantage of people in the church, where it may be. Or I'm going to take advantage of people in my community. I'm going to take advantage of my spouse because I'm going to take advantage of my kids, whatever it may be. Kind of like a drug addict trying to get his next high. I'm going to tell you, I, I got to feed that passion. Hear, I, I'm going to tell you whatever you need to hear just so I can get but that. But the drug addict, everyone knows like that's not good, but, but there's some of the things that you may hide or that sexual sin, whatever I, that desire be. I guess, I guess why I felt like, um, as you guys know, I said it pretty much as an absolute. And I guess why I felt like I said that is I really feel like this sin always comes with a brother or a sister. Like we follow sports. You, 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 I mean, this is nothing. For those of you who follow sports or I'll just say sports and musicians. How about that? That way I think we get about the whole audience. If you ever look at their lives, you know, rock and roll is sex, drugs, rock and roll. You know, there's all in 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 the whether it's football or basketball, right? The the news that broke about Dwight Howard. You know, if you get a lot of money, usually that 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 lust for sexual temptation is right behind it. If you already have that lust for sexual temptation, there's always something, whether it's manipulation, whether it's other deviances, there's always something that comes partnered with it. In other words, I guess what I'm saying, that friend called sexual sin always brings another friend. And that's what I was getting to. And if you can't control that area of your life, because this is the one area you've got to control. Now, I, I say that because of the rising statistics of mm, a graphic, right? View, views and, and stuff going up. The, the highest, the fastest growing audience is women. So it used to just be dubbed a man thing. Like, look at all the women rappers that are coming out now with all the vile and disgusting songs. And you Listen. I grew up, you guys weren't alive yet, but I grew up in the 80s when Two Life Crew came out and every, nobody wanted to admit they were listening to him because you just, there was some things you just kind of kept on the DL. And then, you know, Short was around, Too Short, you know, shout out Bay Area, you know, that came out, Freaky Tales, I can go on and on because I did not grow up in church, okay, and I know them all. Um, that, that wasn't, we still have some type of respect, you know what I mean? Like all the old timers out there, you know, all, all, all the hente out there who know what I'm talking about, old school people, you didn't, you didn't blast that when your mama was around. You didn't blast that when grandma was around. My wife told me the other day, we live in a suburban outside of Fresno called Clovis. And my wife was, my wife was driving out to the ranch and she was on her way right by Clovis East. She said that she had her window down. We're just kind of, you know, just have a little bit of meditation time, breathing in some fresh air. And this, and this lady pulled up next to her with her kid in the car. And my wife says she looked over and it was this total white lady. I have to be descriptive. So people go, like, well, see, he's racist again. No, it's just, it was a white lady with her little girl in the car. And my wife said the song that was on was absolutely raunchy. And her and her daughter were just bopping their head to it. And she was like, I, 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 that's bad. That's the type of infusion I'm talking about that's going on. You got a mom still trying to be the daughter's best friend. Mm. Parents, God didn't call you to be their friend. They called God called you to be the parent. And you over there listening to some nasty rap with your daughter because you two want to make a TikTok video. It always comes with a friend. That's that's why I said it. No, I I guess maybe I misunderstood. It. I agree with that. But I guess I was what I was saying is it's not the only one. 
Yeah, but, correct, but, I, correct, correct, correct. but yeah, sexual sin, I think it's going to bring other destruction to your life. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and it goes back to what I was saying. Oftentimes we see the other things and we're like, what, what is happening? Like, why are they at, at, why are they acting out of character in these different ways? I got you. Okay. And then oftentimes you find out that they've got all this other stuff going on. Yeah. And no, so you're it's right. the, it is the friend. Yeah. 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 You're right. You're right. Um, let me ask you one question though, before we move on. Cause I, 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 this is a question. And by the way, I think I told you I was struggling with this question. It was a question I have for myself. I think we talked about that day. Um, the one thing I couldn't wrap my head around and I still can't. And I, I believe there's more to the story. I just don't know the story is why do all the apostles talk about us so much from Matthew all the way to the book of revelation where it's last mentioned, they talk about the dangers of sexual immorality. And Paul is the one who says, listen, if we could classify sins as felonies and misdemeanors, this is a felony. This is the only one where you sin outside of the body and against your own body. It's a double whammy. It is, it is, a, it, is a, it is a, it is the first buy one, get one free right here. This is the first BOGO, right? And so my question to you guys is, are we missing something? Are we not placing a big enough emphasis on this that it's mentioned 23 times? And it's mentioned as a, you know, a dual whammy type of felony here. Why aren't we stressing it enough or am I overshooting this and making it more than it needs to be? That's the question I couldn't answer, but I throw it out to you guys. Maybe you have the answer. Maybe you just have more questions, but are we missing something or is this a really big deal? I think one of the things God cares about the most is, is marriage. I mean, he established it. I mean, he looks at Adam and said, no, it wasn't good for him to be alone. And I think the number one, one of, I almost say number one, but one of the biggest attacks on marriage and establishing a family is sexual sin. So it's going to it destroy if you just if you're if you're if you're feeding that you're going to end up cheating on your spouse or not even get married. And you're going to go around and sleep with as many people as you can. And you're going to continue to not have a family, not having kids that you're there for. And so you're going to continue to destroy, destroy the family. And I mentioned this yesterday okay. growing up in church, like it was made up of families. It was like I was known more by my last name than my first name. Like we had all these different families. You had the Caraways, you had the Horns, you had the Fords. It's like all these families that you knew, and that's what the church is made of. Huh. Okay. You, you so if you don't have strong families, then it's like okay, where's the church at? You just all you have is people coming in who are who are not united, and the families are built up the church. Sexual sin has a huge impact on the way God established us from the very beginning, which us rep, being married represents. Has also we look at. Represents the, the Trinity. Represent the unity in Christ. You're right. You're right. Do you feel like? Do you feel like though? And let, let's just be honest, because that's what we pride ourselves on—the not offended podcast, culture's influence on the church. Um, do you feel like if we were to say, if I can, top ten of the hardest sins to overcome, right? Top ten of the hardest sins to overcome. Where would you put sexual? And and when I talk about sexual immorality, I'm talking about lust, pornography. You know, all all that mm. comes inside that little package. Fighting the temptation of of temptation when it comes to the opposite sex. What do you put that on the top ten scale of like th th this is hard to fight against? Like this is what not, you know a good portion of the people in the church. This is what they're they're fighting against. What which ten anger, you know greed? Where would you put sexual immorality in the in the package that comes with it? Is there something that would beat number one for it? Like, I think it's I don't one. have one. Go ahead. I, I don't think so. I think if, if you're looking at the total package, like total you, package. I would say it's one. Like what the enemy hits with. Because I think that that probably everybody would be able to find something within that sexual immorality package that, that they wrestle with. Mm -hmm. Struggle? I don't know. Wrestle? Probably, yeah. Would you would you put mm. like money, like greed up there as number one? Or you, or you think this is like, what would you give me? Uh, the, pride is still a big one. I feel like just that I'm not disagreeing with you. Um, cause I, cause I, I think I would say, okay, pride. Once again, going back to Tim, mm -hmm. Cohen, it's the root of all. So of yeah. course I, I, I could say pride is number one because you're being prideful in the way you're viewing the sexual. Okay. But I'm saying outside of the pride, cause that's the root of all sins. What, what would you say? What would, would you? Where would you? Where would you rank sexual immorality? If pride is already the base foundation, where would you rate it? Yeah, it'd probably be number one. I mean, I think even that, even in the Christian church, you like you you talk about this a lot because people fight, deal with it, and people who want to be faithful to their spouse, 
like you legitimately, I want to be, I love this person. I want to be faithful to them. And that person needs to be careful to and fight for their marriage to be faithful to their spouse. Because like, even though you want to do that, there's still this thing pulling at you. And I think everyone deals with that. And there's people who just let themselves go. And there's people who don't want to do that. And they still have to fight with it. Yeah. They could tend to be faithful to their spouse. And you see, that's why God mentions it so much. No, I think you're right. Mm-hmm. And I think you, and I don't want to gloss over this because it's very important. It messes up the family. And you cannot have a strong church without strong families. I think you're 100% right. And I think this is the way the enemy moves in and what he tries to do. Yeah, because you just continue trying to feed yourself and at least other areas. Like, right. I just just I just want to be satisfied. Who cares about the kids? Who cares about my spouse? Like, well, I need to be satisfied. And, and I would even go this far. If you guys just give me another just 30 seconds. If you had a lot of money, that's probably coming right behind it. You're, you're able to. You're able to. What? Uh, not that we should quote Chris Rock. Not that we should, mm. but I will on this point. He said, um, most men would cheat if they had the opportunity. And at first I wanted to, I wanted to clap back at that. And I'm thinking, nah, there's a lot of truth, whether it's in the church or outside the church. Yeah, that's probably real. If, if a man knew he had the opportunity, he wouldn't get caught and he wouldn't blah, 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 all the factors. I don't know. And if it wasn't, what would the old Psalm say? The old hymnist, uh, I, I think it was Wilberforce who wrote, um, he said, and there go I, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I never try to think highly of myself and there go I, if it wasn't for the grace of God and there go I, if it wasn't for the grace of God, does that make sense? So I, I do, th- I do think that's up there. Uh, I just want to encourage too, if, if we can, um, if you're watching this and you are caught up in t- some type of sexual sin, go to your pastor, go to somebody you could trust, ask for help. Um, God, God is, God has designed you to be free, not enslaved to anything. And God wants you to be free and God's word will set you free, but go get the help you need. Remember this. You're only as sick as your secrets. And I learned that at, uh, I learned that from pastor Chris Hodges and that set me free. And so I just encourage you to go get the help you need and don't be embarrassed or ashamed about it. Go get freedom. It's well worth it. Okay. So I need to talk about something, um, in this last segment, because I feel like it's going to play a pivotal role. As you guys know, I think it's less than 75 days away now to election. And people are already starting to lose friends on Facebook. This is, this is already happening. And people are just bugging out and weirding out. Um, I, need, I, I, I recently came across a, um, a person who was on the Joe Rogan podcast. And I started listening to him because he was talking about the pyramids of Egypt. Long story short, he does a lot of different talks. I think his name is Ben something. He's a black guy, Ben something. I can't remember um, his last name. But anyway, mm-hmm. he said something that, that I found a little clip. And it wasn't even on the Joe Rogan Pox. It was on something else. And he said, listen, for all of you guys who think there's Republicans and Democrats, you're being played. There's power structures. There's power structures. And the power structures have set it up on both sides that they have people in both parties. And their number one goal is to stay in power. You've been saying that the entire time. The number one goal of a politician is to stay in power. And so I was thinking about that after he said that. I was thinking more and more. And I was thinking about what's going on. And as you know, this last week, Robert Kennedy endorsed Trump, which he's from the Kennedy family who've been lifelong Democrats. They've been the stalwarts. They've been the icons of the Democratic Party for the last, what would that be, 70 years, 80 years. Okay. Now, what's interesting before he had endorsed him, everybody who knows Robert knows he's been a big proponent of vaccines and the food industry. He's convinced that both of these are making us sick, but he's always done it on a democratic platform. Just hear me out another one minute. Nobody ever really said anything bad. However, for the last few months as he's been running for a presidential candidate, they've given him no platform to do any debates and they've given him no secret service detail. You can Google all that. You guys can see all this for yourself. And now, but they hadn't really thrown any shade on him because people like Aaron Rodgers, Bill Maher, some of the other you know left-leaning people have really endorsed this guy. They really like this guy, okay? Which, outside of some a few policies, I like the guy. Like this whole thing about investigating the food industry, he came out real hard against COVID. The vaccines that it still does. Says it's a sham, say people got rich came out real hard against all the vaccines for kids. Hey, we're the only country in the nation or we're the sickest in the nation. Something's wrong. I liked him outside. I liked him because of that. And I didn't like it because some of, he was really on extreme on some other ends, but I won't go there. All of a sudden he endorses Trump and the media starts 
going crazy. They pick on everything from his vocal injuries. He has a vocal, um, he has a vocal uh, disformity that makes him talk the way he talks. So he was, it was pretty much born that way, if you could say it that way. So genetic disposition. Anyway, sister has it too. Um, you know, uh, they bring up he's on steroids because he's physically fit. Now, this the newest one they brought up. You ready for this? They found some guy who he went to college with, and they said this guy sold me cocaine. He ain't been in college for fifty plus years. There was cocaine in the White House just a year ago, and it got no run. And you gonna bring up somebody's past from 50 years ago? It just goes to show you, and I said this when I posted it on my story on Instagram. I'm like, they gonna try to kill this dude. They do not want Trump and Kennedy together. Because you know what Trump said at his rally? He said, I'm gonna put Robert Kennedy in charge of investigating all these pharmaceutical con- uh, companies and what they're doing and why we have to have all these vaccines. You know what I thought? You know what my first thought was when he said that? I said, that dude dead. That brother needs some secret service detail now. They're going to try to assassinate this fool because that's too much money. Hey, everybody knows it gets real when you start messing with what? The money. Money. You start messing with the money, ask a lot of rappers who've died. You start messing with that paper, you end up dead. Allegedly, suspiciously, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, man, and then somebody posts this clip of that the media has bought and paid for. Watch these talking points. I want to show you guys. I said all that to set this up. They're out for Robert Kennedy. This ain't going to be the first. They're going to be bringing up stuff when he was like seven. I feel like we're on the episode of Goonies again when, when Chunk got busted. He starts bringing and when I, and when I, and when I, and when I was six, I stole my sister's candy bar. Like They're going to be bringing up stuff from like Robert was like a toddler, like at three. He stole the big wheel. You know what I mean? But watch these talking points. I want to, I want to see your reaction. Watch this clip. Headley. And I'm Ryan Wolf. Our, our greatest, greatest responsibility, responsibility is, is to, to serve, serve our, our Treasure Valley communities. The El Paso, Las Cruces communities. Eastern Iowa communities. Mid-Michigan communities. We are extremely proud of the quality, balanced journalism that CBS4 News produces. But we are concerned about trouble and trying to be responsible, one-sided news stories plaguing our country. Plaguing our country. The sharing of biased and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish the same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of biased and false, false news, news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 This is it, we, we should all try it. We should all try our, <laughs> this is extremely dangerous. Are we, are we being played? Um Well, when you see the same news uh outlet like so ABC across the board, like I can understand why the transcript would be the same in Cincinnati, Cincinnati as it is in you know, Cleveland and whatever. Uh when you start to see them cross over, it makes you wonder. Because, you know, I thought Fox and ABC weren't supposed to be friends. I thought Fox and CBS weren't supposed to be friends. But it sure seems like they're saying some of the same talking points. Are we being played? Uh, I mean, obviously, they, they're they putting out the same message. I mean, I don't trust all what the media says anyways. I mean, after the stuff we had went through, I mean, they just make up stuff a lot of times. So, um, I, don't, I don't know all the, like, subsidiary... Uh, um, news outlets and, and the news things that go on now because of the online platform people are able to do stuff one guy had Andrew Cuomo on Chris Cuomo uh, used to be CNN and his brother was the governor of New York during COVID and this guy was drilling him on his talking points and he goes what I don't understand is none of you guys figured out Joe Rogan by himself has a larger platform than all your news networks combined 
and you had you never asked yourself why are people tuning into him and not you and that's because you guys pushed a false and he told me you pushed a false never narrative about ivermectin and all of you guys with your talking point said it was a horse dewormer horse dewormer has no benefits no benefits and now you yourself are changing your tune and you say ivermectin works and he got into a lot of trouble at the dnc convention when he did that when he did this little airing of all these booths that are for rent in there and he said how all these people are paying all this money but yet they're attacking billionaires yet those are 100 million dollar booths to buy in to get into this thing he goes this is all fake I feel like we're being played on both sides. And I feel like you have to learn to go find the truth. It's like this. They did a man on the street out in front of the DNC convention. And they said, what do you hate about Trump? What do you think the number one answer was? What do you hate about Trump? Uh, either a racist. Ding, Is that ding, it? Okay. Ding, 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 ding. Family feud. I get the first. That, first that, was, that was number one. What do you okay. think the second, the second thing they brought up about Donald Trump that they hated? What was he going to do? This is your chance. Don't get a strike. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. You can't do I don't know. That's not an option. Take away money. Send the immigrants back. I don't know. In democracy. Oh. They hmm. said he was going to end democracy. Yeah, that's which, dangerous. You don't want that to happen. Well, what, what's funny is um, I haven't met a single person yet who voted for Kamala Harris. You're saying who's going to? No, that's not to? what I said. Who has voted for her? I haven't met a single person who has voted for Kamala Harris to be the vice presidential nominee for the Democrats. Wait, what? To be the presidential nominee? So listen to what I said. It's not a trick question. Oh, I feel like we're getting tricked. This is not a trick question. I promise you. I'm going to put it to you another way. She's never, she's never won a vote. I'm going to put it to you another way. You will never meet a person who voted for Kamala Harris to be the vice president nominee for the Democrats. Yeah, because it's an appointment. No, because they didn't hold an election. The only person people voted for in these primaries was Joe Biden. He dropped out. States held primaries, just like we hold a primary for who we want to nominate as the. You're, okay, so you're saying nobody has, no, you can't find somebody who voted for her to be the presidential election, a ele- uh, president. That's right. Right. I think I think you said vice president. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. That's why. Well, well like, she is the vice president. Yes. You haven't okay. found anybody. Nobody. No. No Democrat has voted for her to be the presidential nominee, because they held no votes. I thought they did something. No, they held a roll call. Oh, they, the they had the they delegates. had the what the delegates they had the caucuses the delegates who automatically determined and never asked their constituents who they wanted to vote for. But it's Donald Trump going to get rid of democracy. The two things they say about him: democracy and he's a racist. But yet, no matter what happens, and I'm going to show you this. I want to I want you to watch this clip of this from a black woman. So anybody who can't tell who watches this and listen to what she says about Donald Trump being a racist. I want you to watch this. When it comes to President Donald Trump, a lot of people accuse this man of being a racist. I, too, was one of the ones that said, no, I don't want to go talk to that man. He hates black people. That's what they said. But I had a story. I wasn't going to be worried about emotions. I was going to go in with my story and see if I could make a difference. Many of you may or may not know that I served time in a Georgia state prison. And while I was serving time in that prison, I was pregnant. I was transported to a hospital here in Georgia by a police officer. And I was chained to a bed and I was forced to give birth to my baby with a sheriff watching for a nonviolent crime. I found myself sitting in front of President Trump in the Oval Office and I shared my story. Just so happened that he heard my story. Not only did he pass the First Step Act, overturning the 94 crime bill that massively incarcerated Black America, freeing nearly 20,000 people to this day. He also made it illegal for them to chain women to the bed during their childbirth. This white man that they told me was a racist. But yet he's a racist. Been trying to tell you guys. It's tricky. (laughs) (laughs) So they said um, right now, um, Donald Trump is polling better than any Republican presidential nominee ever Hmm. in the history of votes amongst black men. 
and that he is getting up to insane numbers that might rival Democratic nominees outside of Obama. That's how many black men are now Trump supporters. Um, if you're not careful, the media will have you to believe that Donald Trump is a racist. And this woman's getting up here sharing her story. She got nothing to gain. She got nothing to gain. And she's just sharing her story that this is what he did for me. And I'm just sitting here going, I submit to you, if Donald Trump was a racist, he'd have never done that. Racist people don't do that type of stuff. They don't just have a change of heart like that. Well, and somebody would say, well, he, he did it. He Maybe he did it just for a power move, you know, a, a political power move. But when you're as big as he is, you don't have to. You, you, you can just stay racist. You, I don't have to challenge to change. I don't have to bow down. I don't have to do anything. I can stay racist. I already got elected. It doesn't matter. Exactly. So I, I, that, that point would make be mute to me. Yeah. What do you think? Um, he doesn't appear racist, um, but I don't know. He could be. But to me, I, from what I can see, he doesn't seem racist. Okay. But, but how could he be if he doesn't appear? I, 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 don't, I don't know him. Okay, but I've met very few closet racists who are able to stay racist, and you never know. Sure, I don't okay. think I've met. Now, now I'm not saying he's not. I'm not saying he doesn't have prejudices. I think everybody has prejudices. I think all nationalities have prejudices. You know, mm. um, especially if you start talking about certain areas of the United States where <laughs> there's more mics. Oh, <laughs> he did, didn't he? He did. No, do no, that, no yeah. I just play. But uh, yeah, well, yes. To, but, to say that we all do have prejudices. We, we all do. Everybody. Everybody. Um, I was talking to John yesterday uh, at the baptisms, and um, he was telling me about a guy that was on a Zoom with them, and he said the guy's name. I said, I don't think that's Mexican. And John goes, Well, he spoke Spanish. I go, Nah, man. I, I think he speaks Spanish, but I don't think it's Mexican. So we go on his page, and sure enough, he's Portuguese. And John and I were laughing because like. Portuguese and Spanish, I think it's somewhere near 60% of the, the words are the same, mm -hmm. but it's those very, it's that other 40% that makes a huge difference. Like, cause they're W's, they, they pronounce it as V's and, and all this stuff. Anyway. And so John and I were talking, I was like, man, it's like a fancy Spanish right there. <laughs> you know, cause it just sounds so much more like a little French twist to it or something. And that's just the thing, you know, people would say, well, well, that was, that was prejudice. Well, it probably was, you know, every culture has prejudices but to call him a ra i don't think he's a racist um i don't think a person who loves sports the way he loves sports music the way he loves music boxing the way he loves boxing he's a big ufc fighter uh like you know he's a big fan i i just find it hard prejudice yet yeah, racist i don't know i don't think so I, I wouldn't buy that but what i am saying is the media would try to sell you on that but i guarantee you i guarantee you um they have an agenda for why they want you to buy that. Does that make sense? Okay. So I want to get to another part. Uh, I, I, I'm going to bring up another segment next week. I'm doing a little bit more research on it, but you guys can get ahead. It starts called the Mandela Effect. And I believe that's what's controlling the media. So we're going to talk about this uh, a little bit next week. Uh, may get into the UFO thing with it. I don't know. We may tandem it. I'm not sure. But I thought we would start talking about testimonies. I came across a testimony the other day, and I was just blessed by it. And, um, I just want to share it with you guys. I just want to get your, get your take on it. But I, I don't know if I'm the only one, but I love hearing people's testimonies. Do you guys like hearing people's testimonies? I love it. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then, um, we're going to close with today with encouraging people who've never shared their testimony to share their testimony. Okay. So watch this testimony. So here's the thing. I was, you know, in the streets making that crazy kind of music. I had an encounter with God um, when I was 16 years old. Went in the church high. Pastor laid hands on me and literally felt the Holy Spirit fell out in the spirit. Oh God, took away one high me a new one. God, fight against the devil, you know who won. Uh, just a little west side child of God. Yeah, yeah. Lie, test my hey. God, not nah, why would I Christ like living in a movie and his life like come and take a look at what my life like walking by my faith and not the eyes. All right, that was Miles Minnick. Shout out to Miles. Uh, I, I have met him before. Um, I, it, but the funny part is, I didn't know who he was. Um, I didn't know he was a rapper. I didn't really know anything about him outside they live in the Bay Area. Shout out Bay Area. Super cool guy. We had a super great conversation. And to hear his testimony about that, that you know he was using this gift for the devil. We talked about gifts earlier. You know, calling. Um, we talked about you know knowing your identity, and knowing your abilities, and then he popped up on my feed, and I saw that he was a rapper, 
and I started listening to some of the songs. I was thoroughly blessed by them. As you guys know, I still love hip-hop and rap. So um, I just loved hearing that testimony. 16 years old, he had had plans to go one way, and God called him. And I just thought that was truly, truly special. So um, anyway, I just wanted to share that part of your testimony. I was super proud of him. I know he's loving the Lord, living for the Lord. I think that's great. And he makes really, really good music. Y'all should check it out. So testimonies. Uh, Mike. If somebody was watching right now and they said, well, I don't know how to go about sharing my testimony. Do you have a little blueprint for them? Do you have a little word of encouragement? Like, hey, you could do this and this and this, and then this is what you should do. Do you have something that you could share with them on how to share their testimonies? If they're out there right now wondering, what, where do I even start? Yeah, uh, I would um, start by maybe just writing it down, getting your thoughts um, you know, out, maybe just onto some paper. Uh, I know that there's a blueprint that we kind of use around here, sure, which right. was, uh -huh. w which is, you know, what was your life like before you met the Lord? Okay. And then what was something that brought you to him? Maybe it was a season. Maybe it was a moment. Maybe it was just for him. Literally, it was just walking into a church. Yep. Um, so what was that experience? And then what has your life been after that? Okay. And as you're writing this out, you know, I would encourage people to put more of the emphasis on the middle and the ending rather okay. than on the beginning. Um, you know, people, uh, you don't need to share your war stories. Uh, you need to highlight the Lord and what he's done there in your go. life. So as you're writing this out, um, you know, I think usually when you have an opportunity to share what the Lord's done in your life and your testimony, it's, you know, at the water cooler at work, you know, maybe it's, uh, uh, you know, with your cousin at a barbecue. So you often don't have a microphone in 45 minutes to share your story. So as you're writing it out, think about uh, what, how would I say this in a conversation gotcha. that I've, where I've only got maybe five minutes. Bishop, that was good. Thank you. Bishop, can you talk to the people out there who maybe don't have such a checkered past? Maybe they grew up in church. Maybe they didn't really ever do anything wrong. Never locked up. Never sold drugs. Never did drugs. But they're like, hey, I don't feel like I got a testimony. How would you encourage them uh, to share their testimony with people at work who maybe are on the other side of the tracks and done time and rob stores and all that? What would you say to them and how would you encourage them? Um, I think for even, for even anyone just to think of the testimony in this way, that it's not about you. And that's kind of weird because you're telling your testimony of what God did in your life. But if you think of it that way, it'll help you um, change your perspective on it because you want people to walk away to be in all about God, gotcha. that it glorifies God. And so I think when you see it that way, you're not worried about what my past was or what I wasn't that bad or I have really, there's no, there's no big like aha moment. It was like the aha moment is them coming, them coming to realize who, how good God is. And so your testimony, that's why if you've been a Christian for a day or you've been a Christian for 10 years, you have some type of encounter with God. And you can, you can share with people, man, this God is good and glorify him in your testimony. Hey, man, thank you guys. That was so good, both of you. I like that, though. This is about God and what God's done in your life. I love that. I just want to talk to all the leaders out there, not necessarily pastors, but leaders who run some type of platform. And I would like to say, make space for people to share their testimonies. The Bible is very clear that it's by the blood of the lamb and the power of a testimony that you overcome the enemy, that there's nothing more powerful than that testimony. People get encouraged. Matter of fact, I would say to all you leaders, you want to see your group grow? Have a testimony night. Watch people invite friends. Do you want to see people get excited? Have a testimony night. Watch people get excited about what God has done in other people's lives. If you really want to see the church catch fire, leave space for people to share their story. Because once they start sharing it in church, they're going to share it at their jobs. They're going to share it with family members. They're going to share it on the streets. Why? Because there's something that just can't go wrong when you share your testimony. A lot of times we try to preach. We mess up a word or two. We mess up a verse. We forget something. But if you're sharing your story, story man do you get that right and people are just amazed and they give glory to god for how great he is uh, as we say here at the church uh, we love to hear your story as you hear our story so we can write history in the book of life so keep that in mind thank you for tuning in to not a podcast peace we're out